Okay. Welcome and good evening. I'm Susan Williamson, the festival director. Welcome to the 17th annual Palm Beach Poetry Festival and to our final, formerly known as the finale reading featuring David Baker, Eduardo Sicoral, and Vibe Francis. Before Andro Angela Narciso Torres introduces each of our three readers, I'd like to thank our founder and president, Miles Kuhn and his wife, Mimi, our sponsors, Morgan Stanley, the Legacy Group of Atlanta, Gladstone Multimedia, the Cultural Council of Palm Beach County, Visit Florida, Murder on the Beach Bookstore, the National Endowment for the Arts, and all of our other sponsors and supporters, individuals and organizations. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce, to bring our, our introducer, Angela Narciso Torres, up on the screen, and she will begin with introductions of David Baker. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the final reading of the 17th annual Palm Beach Poetry Festival. What a week it's been. When 22-year-old Amanda Gorman took the stage and read her poem on Wednesday's inauguration, a nation sat still and listened. Later, she said, to me, words matter. We've seen over the past few years, the ways in which the power of words has been violated and misappropriated. And what I want to do is reclaim poetry as that site in which we can repurify and re-sanctify the power of words. Words matter. Tonight, I'm pleased to present three poets who show us each in their singular way of naming, singing, saying, and imagining to use Gregory Orr's wonderful taxonomy and through their work as poets, educators, and forces in the writing community that words matter. We begin with critically acclaimed poet, essayist, and educator, David Baker. He is the author of 12 books of poetry, including Never Ending Birds, Scavenger Loop, and most recently, Swift, New and Selected Poems, published by Norton in 2019. Of this collection, The New Yorker says, Baker's poems depend on long acquaintance with a small place, where even the arrival of a feeding monarch or a nagging blue jay becomes a standout event. His work evinces the moral courage of keeping still in the landscape. In our era of climate change, his poetry's mandate to measure the rhythms of the year has become a valuable form of witness. David's poems bear witness to nature, to our changing ecology, and most importantly, to the individual and their place in the world, embracing notions of history, home, and memory. In a recent interview, David says, it is essential to me to name names, whether in terms of etymology or natural typology or political accuracy. Names are part of our manner of identification, how we recognize things, but also how we relate to them. Yes, naming matters. Being begins with naming. David Baker's work has been lauded and recognized widely by the Poetry Society of America, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Guggenheim Foundation. He teaches at Denison University where he holds the Fordham Chair of Creative Writing. David has also taught at the MFA program at Warren Wilson. He serves as poetry editor for the famed Kenyan Review. How fortunate for us that David Baker continues to write, teach and inspire us with his masterful, attentive and necessary poems. Poems that come in Joanna Klink's words from showing us our own grief, our own loss of interconnectedness and nature's capacity to offer us ways back into presence. They are full of everything I value most, 
humility, wonder, and a heartbreaking love for the world. Without further ado, please give a warm welcome to David Baker. Thank you so much, Angela. Hi from Granville, Ohio, population about 3,000 and a lot of snow. I'm so pleased to read with Fivey and Eduardo tonight. And I'm resisting my temptation to thank people by name because I just want to thank you all. And I won't catalog the names. I will instead like to dedicate tonight's reading to my workshop to the people I've been working with. I've picked poems um, for them based on some things that we've been talking about. These are almost all new poems. Um, what a week, right? This is a poem called Hold Hands. I've written it in guilt, in the midst of what we've done. It started as a love poem and turns into something else. Hold hands. We were in the trees. White curtains opened. Your shoulders in my hands, then your knees drew upward. Rain like petals there. Rain like breeze. Now the birds were in the trees, two stories up our window, where blowing leaves were level with our sheets. We were in the street. We were holding hands as hands were holding us. What hands there were were where we were, in trees. Our children there as songbirds were. The hands where we were in the trees were holding us there, where we were in the street. Please the rain, to please the petals in the breeze like rain. Please to draw your hair along my hands. Your hands are holding us. Lines along the window lane are holding us like songs as now the songs, the sirens in the trees. Lines along the window lane, your hair in feathers where the children are, whose curtains singing, whose hands are holding us, who cry like birds, hold hands. The birds are in the trees, the birds, our children, they're in cages singing in the trees. This poem is called Six Hours. Earlier this week, I had the chance to talk about a poem by a dear friend of mine, Stanley Plumley. This is a poem that is an elegy for Stanley um, and is about spending six hours in the hospital with him near the end. I drove back and forth uh, to see him. The poem is in six short sections. I won't name the sections. Six hours. His hands are folded and gathered on his chest. Each arm is a wing in stillness tucked close. He has laced his fingers loosely over and under like the strings of good shoes. Someone has come to check his breathing, tap the tubes, add a few numbers to the chart. We might see his father's hands in these hands. He might hold them for us, pages in a book. What book? We'd swear he moved. Now someone has opened a blind and the sun comes wild with sudden bright splashes over the room, the side table with its small cup of pills. He blinks one eye to the warmth. He's resting his head on two pillows. Did he smile? In a poem he calls hands requisite for reading, for holding, holding nothing. 
He looks as though he's holding back breath from a wound. Or if he were standing, touching his heart to see if his pulse were secure, his hands are still, soft to touch when we touch, and dappled with a canker of field crabs in a yard in Ohio, in the sun, the boy in him might pick one and throw it to scatter those blue jays back into clouds. We are gone. Even the night cooling down is slick with heat. Even the sheet we share like a humming skin. From three stories up, the sounds of the street, drinkers at the curb, a wet hiss of dry tires is a rhythm through our box fan like panting. When we sleep, it is piecemeal until morning. Listen, the years are short. They are nothing. I write each morning while you are at work. In the heat of day, I walk to the library, cold water at the fountain, air conditioned air. Walk with a new book back in the elm lined shade. At night, I meet you at the top of the stairs. Where are you gone, who loved me so long one summer, far from home? Days are long. Even the heat is lovelier there, as memory is. We make lemonade from powder. Little wonder the years are less than a breath, like a song on the radio heard as the rhythm of languor whistle of the ice cream truck, drinklers at the curb, days and night of heat, of sex, such tenderness. When we sleep sometimes, it is to dream of the days. Where are they gone? Meeting on the stairs, laughter and light, a small meal, a bottle of wine. When we wake, it is piecemeal, until we are gone. It's snowing here in Ohio. It is not snowing in Palm Beach. So I'm going to read a, a tropical poem. A little bitty one. This is for my, my crew. Just a very simple scene and timing. After, we came to the island. We stayed in the house. Rain and sun, bougainvillea, pink cedar. How many shadows slipped along walls or wetted the leaves of century plants? We saw clouds from the windows far boats. You left the bed and came back shaking. Your mother, her white hair, or something whose shape would never at last find you. Night palms clattering like hungry bowls, crazy whistling of the island peepers. We walked to the water walked back. We walked to the water, walked back. This one is called Elegiac, shortest poem I've ever written. Two lines, it's an elegiac couplet for my father. 
The moon sets a place for him at the long table. See how his plate shines among the glittering knives. This is for my daughter, Snow Falling. Written recently, but about an event years ago when she was a little girl, I made her a playground in the backyard in the middle of the winter. And I was very ill when I did that. Snow Falling. I aimed to work all weekend. Her teacups, tiny shoes like two thimbles. I had not been well for so long. By the time I wired the backyard, the right tools, a book of specs laid out, its diagrams and directions that I could choose among such languages. It had started first as mist, as cold sheath, less as falling than floating against the gray sublime of pines, like a coat of what's to come a crackling among high needles, more static than whisper, more shiver than chill. She wanted, who's to say then, it's, it's too cold when I'm not well. No, not just now. A place to play in the yard, a slide, a swing or two. Who can say what passes for health when you've been so long fevered? I cut the A-frames to size, measured, marked off spots to drill for the standing platform. I sawed in a white out of sound, but for talking to myself. There were lilacs willing to open their black buds all along the slippery walk, but no. Black water in the creek crusted at the banks. It was like singing the days I tell you, but no, whatever song there was, was frost breaking over the grass, wind leaning against dark limbs. I worked the weekend through, I raised the beams and screwed them tight and fixed a slide so she could play, a swing set, a cradle of snow, a thing I made for her and now it seems for you amid the world's broken and shining things. One more poem. This one is a little bit longer and it's much harder to hear. It's harder to track. This is a COVID poem I've written it this spring. It's called 19 Spikes. There are 19 couplets. It's a poem entirely in pieces and in fragments and in many voices. Um, everything happens, everything happens at once, everything happens over and over again and is used over and over again. It's made out of my own viral illness. When it comes on me, the doctor says, ah, it's a storm, isn't it? Mm. And it's about really just the first time I saw a depiction of the COVID virus and everything that I could think of that looks like that. Yes. Sweet gums. 19 spikes. Then the storm came. It raked our world with terrible teeth. Then dissolved like a calcium spike back into bones. I see what you mean, but your barn's not really a barn. Old lady just sat there, married to the guy 50 years. Wash your doorknob, your hands, triage your mail. I had a nightmare. I was living my present life can't touch my nose. It's called resorption. What? 
It throbs like crickets in my ears. Your BP was what? No touching. COVID petals. She said, wash your hands. It took his body hours to work down through the corn, the quicksand weight of it, her in her folding chair, him with a new auger for the bin. He sort of spilled out. So the viburnum's full of little pink blooms, bees in orbit with their spikes, their barbs, poisons, perfumes. Then the hail balls, jagged as kidney stones, half a foot of rain, trees seem to blow up. Then the whole thing, whoosh. Some natural forms are so successful, they're viral. Calcium nodes on your clavicle. I see them everywhere. How small can they get? How big? Any size explodes. Is it gas? You mean the barn? Is it gas? A heat storm. A barn equals one non-SI metric unit of area equal to 10 to the negative 28 meters squared or 10 hundred femtometers squared to quantify interaction of a nucleus with an electric field gradient. And the branchlets are pithy, many angled, winged, liquid amber stracaflua, surrounded by rusty, hairy bracts. It looks like a tiny naval mine between 80 and 120 spikes, terminal barbs, a special form of moored contact mine and equipped with a plummet he fell right through. The spikes on the outer edge of the virus particles give coronaviruses their name. Sweet gum, storax, red gum, star-leaved alligator wood, limpet mine. In place of torpedoes, the silos carry 12 charges. I heard my heartbeat in my bones, a positive kill rate. Airbnb, missile silo, fixer upper now, swanky bachelor pad, storm shelter, a storage bin, your ultimate safe room. Each virus is a single pleomorphic spherical particle, satin walnut with bulbous surface projections. I see what you mean. Wash your hands. Like that really helps leaves ripped clean off. It's coming back. I know. Thank you all. Wow. Just wow. Thank you, David. I hope you're seeing all the praise in the chat box. Just beautiful. Such a great response. Thank you. Our next reader is Eduardo C. Corral. The first time I read Eduardo C. Corral read was in 2012. His first book, Slow Lightning, had just won the Yale Younger Poets Prize chosen by Carl Phillips. I was on a writing residency at a Benedictine monastery in Rock Island, Illinois, and learned Eduardo was giving a reading at nearby Augustana College. As I sat in the dark auditorium, a younger yet to be published poet, I marveled at his seamless interweaving of English and Spanish in poems that broke down linguistic borders, played with poetic forms and shapes, and brought to life the vibrant particulars of his experiences as a gay Chicano son of immigrants. That night, I rushed back to my room at the monastery with a new resolve to tell my story, my journey as a Filipino American who left her homeland to follow a dream. Eduardo's poems had given me a glimpse of what was possible. They gave me permission. Of that first book, Carl Phillips writes, Part of Corral's point is that language, like sex, is fluid and dangerous and thrilling. In Corral's refusal to think in reductive terms lies his great authority. 
and how lucky we are that his second much awaited book, Guillotine from Grey Wolf Press has arrived. Oh Lord, cries the anguished speaker in the first poem, here I am. That I am asserting itself on the page. About that opening poem, Eduardo says, you get one utterance, one human cry. You enter the book through one voice and you move through many other voices, through a chorus, a community, before arriving again at the lyric self. Indeed, we contain multitudes. Eduardo has received numerous honors, including the Discovery The Nation Award, a Whiting Writers Award, and a fellowship from the National Endowment of the Arts. A Canto Mundo Fellow, he has also held fellowships from Colgate, Bucknell, and Princeton University. Eduardo teaches at North Carolina State University. And now it is my great honor to present to you Eduardo C. Corral. Thank you, Angela, for that wonderful introduction. And it, it thrills me and it warms my heart to know you were in the audience that night. And thank you for listening that night. And, uh, and uh, your readers, <laughs> thank me <laughs> for helping you on, on your path. Thank you so much. Um, what a pleasure and joy to read with Vivi and David. Uh, and what a pleasure to be here at the Palm Beach Poetry Fest Festival. Thank you to everybody who runs the organization, who funds the organization, who staffs the organization. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, a special thank you to the participants in my workshop. I mean, teaching is a conversation and each conversation I have with a workshop with individual, with individual writers, man, my love for the language, for our traditions, for craft is just recharged. And most importantly, my, assumption, my assumptions about language and tradition and craft is troubled, right? They don't, left me out, they don't leave me off the hook, which I appreciate. So I get so much out of the workshop space as much as I think as my students. Thank you to our intern, Mark Stavik, for being there for us and ask, uh, letting me ask these questions often at the last minute. Thank you, Mark, I really appreciate that. I'm gonna read uh, from the second book, Guillotine, which came out this August. One of the central concerns of the second book is the ode chestnut, the ode subject of unrequited love. What happens to a, a person, a lyric speaker, when they yearn and desire and lust somebody who can't return those feelings, those emotions? Uh, so one of the tasks for the second book is I refuse to walk away from the hurt. I stayed at the desk and my laptop until I could interrogate and make visible and complicate that wound. This poem is titled Autobiography of My Hungers, which is a memoir by one of my mentors, Rigoberto Gonzalez. When I first drafted this poem years ago, I kept pouring one specific memory into, uh, onto the page, one specific memory. And for years and years, nothing would work, right? Then I realized that memory was becoming, became a constriction for me. I was forcing all my language to that one specific container, that specific memory. When I made that constriction, that memory, a filter, when I pushed other experiences through it, other um, language uh, from other memories, then the poem kind of blossomed. This is why this poem is about unrequited love, but also remembers coming of age at the height of the AIDS epidemic and tackles also body issues. Uh, weight issues as a, as a gay man uh, who with a bigger body moving through the world. Autobiography of my hungers. His beard, an avalanche of honey, an avalanche of thorns. In a bar too close to the Pacific, he said, I don't love you, but not because I couldn't be attracted to you. Liar, even my soul is pot-bellied, Thinness in my mind equals the gay men on the nightly news, kiss by death and public scorn. The anchor man declaring weight loss is one of the first symptoms. The Portuguese have a word for imaginary, never to be experienced love, whoop de doo I don't love you, he said. The words flung him back, in his eyes I saw it to another bar where a woman sidestepped his desire, another hunger, 
our friendship. In 10th grade, weeks after my first kiss, my mother said, you're looking thinner. That evening, I smuggled a cake into my room. I ate it with my hands, licked buttercream off my thumbs until I puked. Desire with no future, bitter longing. I starve myself by yearning for intimacy that doesn't and won't exist. Holding hands on a ferry, tracing with the tip of my tongue a jawline. In a bar too close to the Pacific, he said, I don't love you, but not because I couldn't be attracted to you. His beard, an avalanche of thorns, an avalanche of honey. Like all writers, I you know, carry language in my skull and my head. Uh, for a few years, when I was still living in Queens, New York, the word guillotine was in my skull, rattling and rattling and rattling. And when I dwell that actively on a word or an image or a phrase, something sparks, something else is given to me, right? And I get, I, I get a gift. But for some reason, this word guillotine would not give me anything. <laughs> so one day at a coffee shop in Jackson Heights, I sat down and by hand, I wrote, up, I wrote out the word guillotine until it filled a page of my, of my notebook. Then I asked myself, what do you see in that, tangle of my, uh, in that tangle of your cursive? I saw scorpions in that tangle of my cursive. Then I saw something else. Guillotine. The scorpions always arrive at dawn, gently, the pincers touch the cuts on my lips. I clutch the edges of the mattress, stare at the mirrored ceiling. My mouth opens, but no sound staggers out. The scorpions, dark green, dank, reach in, pull out the razor blade under my tongue. Two scorpions, a razor blade, slowly in, un in unison without letting go of the metal. They move, a little guillotine making its way down my body. I remember dragging my thumb through his beard, coppery and difficult. The scorpions pause, tilt the blade, a threat, a reminder. It's my task to stop yearning for as long as it takes them to carry a blade across my skin. My thoughts swerve from monsoon storms to accordions to pecan groves. The little guillotine starts moving again. I begin to sense the normity of my body, the blade high in the air for now. This next poem is titled Sentence and uh, it, it borrows slash steals uh, an image from one of my favorite contemporary Canadian poets, Don Mackay. And uh, it's 14 lines and never came together into a sonnet. So it's a, a failed poem, but it's a good failure. Sentence. I crawl back. He unpacks his tools, oils the wooden handles, rinses the metal. Fragrant his thighs, fragrant his sneer. Coy and eternity inked on his skin. An ecstatic blue, a bewildered green. Some wounds are ovals, some wounds are opals. The ears of a white wolf pivot toward the moon. I flee now and then, alone in the desert for months. A nomad in a kimono oppress together dust. Beautiful his throat, his words even more beautiful. It's my turn to ask for a bit more from you. He likes it when I bleed, strangers once. Gently, he hammers gold into a sentence. Gently, the sentence enters me. When I was working on my first and second books, the, the idea that every poem in that in those books had to be really good or dazzling or interesting, filled me with fright and anxiety. <laughs> it's like, how is that possible? <laughs> I can't do that. So I came up with 
what I call buttress palms, you know, but, buttress in architecture, a buttress supports a larger weight, a large wall, right? It, it, it supports, right? It, it, its function is to support, support a wall, a larger weight. I think of these smaller poems that I write, often fragmented or lyrical or more hybrid, or even just narrative, narrative snippets, right? As buttress poems in my collections, right? Then by themselves, maybe not too amazing, but they kind of support the motifs, the subject, other poems around them. This poem is titled, Questions for My Body. Why are you nocturnal? How many cathedrals have you entered? Has cruelty ever saved you? Do you remember the length of his thumbs? Isn't that enough cake? Have you ever soaked your feet in gasoline? Do you still fear the virus? How can you sleep in this heat? Is that a soul patch? Did you laugh or cry at Keith's grave? Have you been claimed? I always tell my uh, students and myself, you know, doubt anxiety should be, is part of the writing process. I mean, you should only worry, you have no doubt anxiety about your work at, at the end of the day. But the trick is to make sure doubt and anxiety is riding shotgun right next to you, right? You are the one controlling the wheel, the journey continuously. But every once in a while, doubt and anxiety, you see it, you hear it. It pushes you to try different things, to read something else, to try a different approach. That's fine, but should, doubt and anxiety should never have its hands on the wheel, right? Always shotgun. With that in mind, uh, when I read this poem in its published form in the second book, I wish I could really take it back or really rework it, but I'm gonna read it anyway tonight. Cordova, which is one of my favorite cities in Southern Spain. In a bathroom with turquoise walls, my reflection bleeds. I reach to clean with my thumb an oval mirror speckled with toothpaste and smeared now with, pen with penicillin rich blood. Then I remember, pull back my left hand. I don't touch mirrors. It's wrong, my father always said, to touch a man. This next poem is in two sections. It returns to uh, the memories and experience of coming, uh, coming of age at the height of the AIDS epidemic, unrequited love, um, feeling unwanted, uh, undesired in, in, in a queer spaces, gay spaces. The first section is really uh, energetic image and statement. Uh, one happens after another, there's a lot of leaping. And the second uh, section is kind of full of stillness, right? It's kind of this, this it's static. I wanted those two energies right next to each other. All this chaos leaping right next to stillness. The title uh, comes from Emerson and the end of part two uh, rephrases something said by St. Augustine. An around every circle, another can be drawn. One, in 10th grade, I kissed a guy who called me a faggot once or twice a week. I still see his voice, six hummingbirds nailed to a wall. In an olive grove outside of Fuente Grande in 1936, a teacher, two bullfighters, and Federico Garcia Lorca were shot to death by fascist soldiers. During the Reagan years, I sweated out new language, capsi sarcoma, febrile, oral candesis. Last summer in Sevilla, I flirted with a stranger. He pinched my belly, walked away laughing. Later, along Calle Arjona, a remix of Girls Just Want to Have Fun poured out of a passing taxi cab. Shut the fuck up, Cindy Lauper, I yelled. Mala copa, joder. The soldier who shot Lorca bragged he fired two bullets into his ass for being queer. For years, I desired a man who didn't desire me. 
He was gentle with my lust. I never thanked him. I'm thanking him now. But once in a splinter rich booth, he held my hand, a kindness I cannot forgive. Two, diminished but quick, I sprint into the desert toward a dust devil slowly twisting along a canal. I step into the grit and whirl, not dust after all, but a spiral of locusts, each a coil of gold, oiled with honey. Long hind legs click, click, click. Not one skims my skin. A thunderhead on the horizon shimmers, half-built cathedral. What a saint said about God, I believe about loneliness. A circle whose center is everywhere and its circumference nowhere. I'm gonna end with two poems. Uh, this next poem uh, yeah, I wrote uh, in Federico Garcia Lorca Park, which is a big park in Granada, uh, Andalusia, Spain. And that's one of the, um, uh, the family house uh, of Lorca uh, in the early 20th, 20th, 20th century. And I spent so much, many days in the park wishing to be contacted by Lorca's uh, spirit, by his presence, by his queerness, by his voice, anything, any kind of contact I, I was yearning for with Lorca, who's a very important poet to me. Uh, I didn't feel nothing, uh, but these lines did come to me. Lines written at Federico Garcia Lorca Park. In the cage of my thumbprint, I keep my third wish, acoustic winter. Rain undresses music, rain undresses his voice, arrow and minaret. Beneath my palm, the wiry fur of lust, open body, open. A wound is a self reporting instrument, silver filigree. I sleep with his face under my tongue, scab on water. The last poem is a, a persona poem. Uh, the, the, the person speaking is a Border Patrol agent, a Mexican American male in his late forties, working the terrain between Tucson, Arizona, and Nogales, uh, Arizona, Nogales, Mexico, uh, the Southern Sonoran, the Sonoran Desert uh, of Southern Arizona where I was born and raised. And uh, I didn't, this voice came to me years ago and I, I refused to put this book in the first book, but the voice refused, uh, the voice did not want to go away. So I had to write the poem uh, for, for the second book. Border Patrol Agent. Summer is a puta. I park beneath branches, crank up the AC in the Jeep. I hate the rear view mirror. It makes me look like my father, chased and singed. Last week, beneath a sky, Walmart blue, in a clearing full of bottles, sneakers, teepee rows, I found a body. Legs gnawed to the knees, barbed wire tight around the throat. I remember graffiti on a boulder. God is always hungry. Sometimes with binoculars, I watch wild horses hurry through the heat. Once a yearling stopped mid gallop, then collapsed into a bed of coals the rain could not extinguish. The radio is always crackling. Six wets sighted on infrared, need a spick speaker stat. I only speak Spanish with my father. He often mistakes blue parakeets perched on the stove for gas flames. Last July, far from Tucson, I found a rape tree, torn panties draped on branches, the tree a warning, a way for smugglers to claim terrain. Lightning climbs a hillside like a stilt walker. Rain strikes the windshield. I think of my wife asleep on her side, breasts pressed together as if one were dreaming the other. Her womb empty, my dick useless. 
There are things I just can't tell her. Sometimes only body parts remain. They're buried in baby caskets. Thank you. And my phone made a little guest appearance at near the end. So thank you for your attention. That was just stunning, Eduardo. Thank you. Thank you for your poems. And so much love for you in the chat. Please don't miss those comments. I love when people write their, their favorite lines down. I wish I could write them all down and save them, but thankfully we have the books. Our final reader for the evening is Vivi Francis. Most of us know Vivi Francis as a beloved mentor and professor currently at Dartmouth College. Some of us know her for her work as an editor for Kalalu. Some of you now know her as a brilliant, rigorous, yet compassionate workshop leader. And if you're lucky enough, a few of you may even know her as the generous dispenser of hugs. <laughs> Fortunately, we all have access to her stunning and necessary work. Being the author of four brilliant collections, Blue Tail Fly, Horse in the Dark, winner of the Kave Kanem Prize, and recently, Forest Primeval, winner of the Kingsley Tufts Award. And we eagerly await her fourth book, The Shared World, forthcoming from Northwestern University. Her many honors include the Eichen Taylor Award for Modern American Poetry, fellowships from Kave Kanem and the Kresge Foundation, and the Rana Jaffe Award. In her craft talk on Wednesday, Vivi gave an eloquent, deeply moving discourse about the value of the personal I, the mattering of the I in poetry. Never in my life as an immigrant writing in America have I felt more uplifted, more heartened, more empowered to hear these words from a poet I admire deeply. And I quote, your story matters. You have the right to tell your story in your way. Our story makes us human, makes us part of the collective. In a sense, writing poetry is telling you my name. How delicious to say it, goes one of her poems. To allow it like hibiscus to wend over the tongue where it opens at the gate, lending its red unknowable taste. Your name spun through the wind box, whipped up from the base of me. How I want to say it and hear my own again. Naming it, singing it, saying it makes us human. Poetry makes us human. This is what Vibe Francis teaches us. And now please join me in giving a warm welcome to Vibe Francis. Thank you so much. Um, Angela, for um, those kind words. I know I'm so moved. I'm going to have to gather myself and <laughs> take a deep breath for a second. Um, it's wonderful to be reading this evening with um, you, David, and Eduardo, um, whose work I admire so much. And in this lonely time to be with um, all of you listening tonight, um, and those of you who have expanded me with um, your fine readings and breadth of knowledge over the week. I want to also thank my class. And yes, naming is quite important to me. So Anna, Ariana, Armin, Ashley, and I'm getting emotional as I'm saying your names, Erica, Irving, Janine, Jesus, Judy, Christine, Lynn, Roman, and Yusef. I feel we've been on a necessary and positively altering journey with each other this week. Marcy, I want to thank you for taking such good care of us. And to the rest of the Palm Beach family, thank you for welcoming me. And I must add a special thank you to um, uh, my personal angel, Vaughn. <laughs> as well as Susan, Stephanie, Jennifer, and Mimi, and Miles for being so patient with me um, as I uh, tried to prepare for this week. I'm grateful. 
And if I've forgotten someone, I ask that you forgive me and know that you are included in these things. To forget. Welcome the enemy back with flags of forgetfulness. Let the children go forward yelping as innocents so often do. Make a line, stand in the old formation. Believe, believe. The cells are empty, flesh gone, bones buried, unrecognizable. How well the enemy looks, no longer gaunt, so plump as if something young were had for breakfast. Look, a pick in the tooth. Hooray, bring the enemy back at night by boat or plane. Allow the enemy the crossing. Let them make a grand entrance on the square in the light of morning, in clean white clothes and a handkerchief at the side of the mouth. Let us forgive as the books would have us do. So what the dead past, only the old dare remember and the oldest are without teeth. So be it, the gone, gone. Hasn't the enemy been through enough? Wasn't the enemy there? When your brother dies, you want. When your brother dies, you want nothing more than to be held by your brother. And within that absence, to be held by someone else. It will take that to cry it through. And if there is no one to do so, if there is an embrace, but it doesn't last long enough, you may never feel the joy of wailing. Instead, you may hold on to that cry for years until no one knew you ever needed to cry at all until you believe you are free of tears, until one day standing at the sink, the water running hot over your knuckles, you double over. And that long held cry escapes in a gasp, a memory of that other body in convulsion in the sick bed on the street. The smell of death so close, you forget there are people with you in the room and you almost let go before you were reminded that day is done and there's work before you to do. So you straighten up and continue to do whatever it was you were doing. Close the valve of ache, swallow whatever came up. The shared world, into the bow of your ear, I am whispering the secret story. Now you won't sleep either. Consider it part of your own memory, connecting our childhoods that would have otherwise never crossed. I fell down, your knee was scraped. I stuffed the yellow cake into my mouth and your stomach cramped. When you were abandoned, grief filled my well. The private ravages of our spent youth and adulthood now implicitly intimate. You pull me to you because I have already softened your sharp elbows. The pressure of your fingers in my shoulder leaves such an impression as if in need I had touched myself. We are insomniacs, the grip of night freeing us from the slept through day and its demands. It is true, once you know, you can't unknow. So we ruminate on literature and the gods and continually seek the usia of the empty jug. But we need no wine really. We're eager to get on with it, to take in or do whatever forwards this living, this tripwire, keeping us tied, kite to string, present to past, arrow to quiver. Break me and I'll sing. My voice like marrow, a blood yolk spilled upon the counter. You can't stop this song. More hands than yours have closed around my throat. You may crack me. You have cracked me. I'm frightened, but so what? I'll testify. Witness, if you can, listen. 
I slurped the frog like soup gone bad. Held a brass spoon like a barrel to my mouth. I could tell you what you want to hear, but I'd be broken just the same. So why not sing? I'm singing now, louder this time. And in the round, we are a wounding of red plume birds. Every voice, a bloody feather in the bone crown. Another attempt at the telling. The secret story is the one we'll never know, although we're living it from day to day, Roberto Bolaño. But we do know the secret story. At least we each know our own secret story. And when we grow brave enough, we might share it. And if the party we share it with is honest, they might admit their own. And from there, hands held, we walk into the grotto and dip our hands into the cold waters or meander up, meander up a darkened stairwell into the sweet musk of a bookshop or descend into a speakeasy behind a roped velvet curtain. The secret to knowing the secret is to speak, but we too often tell the stories of no matter to avoid the one story that does. In truth, we are bound by that one story so you'd think by now we tell it, at least to each other. Honey, I'm dedicating honey to those of you who attended HBCUs. Um, I attended an HBCU, Fisk University is where I uh, did my undergraduate work. Every spring, there was always a boy or two who dared to press themselves into the bees. In the Mid-South, the free hives hang close to the bark from limb to ground, taller than the tall boys who would walk toward the mass slowly, quietly, one arm held out and a hand extended delicately as a cotton fan into that susurration. On a small college campus full of the brilliant, the mundane and the mad, boys inevitably slender, but sometimes thinly muscled, would let the bees cover their shirtless bodies, their hair and delicious skin. The loners, the eccentric, boys, always boys, but why, with their own voices sounding in their heads. But I'd like to think it was music they heard, the song of bees, their dislocated thrum, most know to dread. I would watch from the distance and admire their willingness to inhabit what others didn't dare consider. A few years ago, miles from any home I'd known, I walked along an avenue where great bundles of flowers hung just overhead. I stopped. There were just a few bees, but enough. I have been allergic to them all of my life, always carrying an antidote, always afraid, but I wanted to know what I had to lose. So into those blooms, I thrust my arms up to the elbows. No bees stung me, but I fell breathless on the grass anyway and thought of those boys so beautifully drawn, such reckless hosts. I've worn it three days in a row. The dress my mother died in, no, the dress I was wearing when my mother died. And I took pictures of myself. Self, no, of the dress, of my legs curled tight under the dress, only my ankles and feet showing. I held my arm up and back and I did not want to show my head, my swollen eyes and chapped lips and all that dried salt on my face. My face, she couldn't bear to look at unless it was with disgust. My hair, never good, no good. And my unironed dress, this one I am wearing now with its white cotton underslip and its red embroidered roses upon a white background. It is beautiful even with me in it. Yes, I'm not wearing a hat. She said, you look so ugly in that hat. It was my favorite one of three hats. She had over 100 stored in her basement in labeled hat boxes. They were her 
particular thing. Every Sunday, a new one, perched proudly as a bird of paradise, though only the males are so presentable. But she was a tomboy once, and so was her mother. She hated my teacups and my dollies that I couldn't sleep without. Like I slept that day when I found out she had died. I lay fetal upon the bed atop the duvet and wanted to live and felt guilt like a razor over the wrist. You always were odd and always carrying on. You talk too much. You are a mess, and I was a mess. My chest wet and my heart shrinking in, and I was shrinking, and this was good. She was always a small woman, except for 10 years when she grew past what her small frame could hold. Who can say why her hunger grew and why she hated my hunger to be held and so recoiled and I went days and days without any touch at all. And I have gone days and days since, ugly in my hat. Even my father thought so, though now he isn't sure. Since she died, so much has changed. Even this dress, now stained by wear and coffee and crying and the pills won't let me, and now and again sleeping in it, and just last night keeping it on for dinner alone at the same counter where I was when I found out she had died a few minutes after our last phone call when she couldn't see me and so could afford to love me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vivi. Thank you, David. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you, Angela, and everyone who's here. Um, these were extraordinary readings, <clears throat> extraordinary readings. And I am so grateful for your being with us. Um, tonight's poets will be signing book plates for the books you purchase in our virtual bookstore Murder on the Beach from 9.30 to 10.30 p.m. Don't forget to attend tomorrow's Beloved Poem panel at 2 p.m. And that is one of my favorite festival events and um, for a lot of people. I don't want to say goodbye to you all um, because I've loved being here tonight and I appreciate you all so very much, your work and your words. Thank you. Good night.